so we are live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now a very good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, this is dr harsh chatwedi of pulse pharmaceuticals uh, i represent their medical affairs and clinical research uh, taking you uh, welcoming you first uh, you and our uh, our faculty to this uh, very interesting program it's almost uh, i would uh, love to call it a revisiting uh, the usage of paracetamol uh, there have been uh, there are facets that uh, we are conversant with we have known them we know what the drug has been there almost for uh, now 75 to 80 years it's as long as that uh, we have been celebrating our independence you know and uh, it has been providing a relief uh, from febrile conditions it has been it's the most sought after uh, i would go on to say uh, the first line at least when we are talking about uh, uh, pain relief also and uh, yes uh, there have been agents which have come subsequent to paracetamol and uh, there are agents which were there earlier also and uh, what i have learned is uh, no drug is perfect uh, all the drugs do tend to have limitations but yes paracetamol is one which is universally accepted uh, painkiller and is considered to be safe also we can see that uh, it gets used in pediatric population it gets used in uh, uh, irrespective of the gender pregnant women lactating mothers pediatric population tends to use quite a bit and these are all Uh, stem from the what is considered to be the hallmark uh, safety profile of uh, paracetamol. So uh, today uh, we have a very interesting program at our end. We have uh, Professor uh, Anand Pal from uh, Delhi Guru Medical College, uh, who will be <coughs> deliberating on his experience with the use of paracetamol in acute pain and. his uh, talk will subsequently be followed by uh, a deliberation from uh, professor naresh shetty uh, on use of paracetamol <clears throat> in chronic pain i think uh, both of them uh, will be sharing their thoughts and thinking in certain of the aspects like uh, there would be an emphasis on nsaid sparing aspects uh, especially uh, there will be there have been thoughts which have been more frequently been applied uh, to febrile patients especially the children that the combined and the alternating uh, treatment with paracetamol and ns ensets and when we are moving on talking about the chronic pain i'm sure uh, dr shetty will bring in uh, maladaptation uh, to pain which is, <laughs> which is a very important thing because chronic pain um, uh, rather than uh, when we look at acute pain we talk about the survival value and instincts of that but when it's chronic pain we are looking at probably a disease itself and uh, maladaptation to that disease is uh, it's very critical in terms of uh, defining the success of the therapy also uh, somewhere i'm also looking to understand because uh, whatever pharmacology i have learned i i understand that there is a is a huge gap between the analgesic dose and the analgesic uh, threshold the paracetam uh, mode and a much lower uh, antiparietic dose and a much lower uh, uh, antiparietic threshold and then there is a huge jazz my understand when we talk about the toxicity so looking at a dose of uh, at least 15 mg per kg uh, in terms of acute and uh, chronic pain Uh, and the kind of concentrations we are looking at at least in the vicinity of 11.5 to 12 uh, uh, microgram per ml and then a toxic uh, dose and a concentration which is almost uh, i would say 10 times you know uh, at 140 uh, mg per kg so how we can go how we can go achieving uh, the adequate uh, pain relief uh, with safety though we have been doing it but any other newer insights uh, which have come in and especially with the the uh, i would say that what has come in past 5 years or so is uh, 
the TRPV1 and the amyloid receptors and the paracetamol section on other facets. So, <laughs> so they, are, they are talking about a bit of anti-inflammatory activity also and a site of uh, action, which you always believe to be brain and brain. And now somewhere we are looking at the spine, at the spine level as well. So these are certain of the things that uh, we can expect uh, to hear from uh, both Prof. Pal and Prof. Shetty in their deliberations of the day. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows Prof. Pal, everybody knows Prof. Shetty, but it's customary to speak a few lines and introduce. So I'm taking a liberty, whatever I could pick up from the net uh, about either of them and uh, what I thought would be uh, very interesting. I'm going to be sharing it uh, with you. So uh, just a second, I'll be sharing my screen. And uh, so uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Uh, so uh, very warm welcome again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to a very interesting uh, program on the place of uh, paracetamol or untapping uh, the potential of paracetamol in both an acute and the chronic pain. And as I mentioned, we are joined by Professor Shetty and uh, Dr. Paul. And uh, uh, well, everybody knows Professor An Paul is currently with Jalpaiguri Medical College Department of Orthopedics at Jalpaiguri. He is a former head of Department of Orthopedics at IPGMER and SSKM Hospital at Calcutta. Uh, Dr. Paul has 43 international and national publications uh, in various index journals. He has authored the book, An Atlas of Orthopedic Radiology. Dr. Pal is a recipient of Inspiring Orthopedician of India from Economic Times uh, in 2019. He has also received the A. Meta Gold Medal at National Conference in, uh, in the Orthopedic Association in 2002. S.N. Bakshi Gold Medal Award for Best Publication in Indian Journal of Orthopedics in 2012. Joy Patankar Gold Medal for the Best Public Presentation in Pediatric Session in IOPAN in 2019. Professor Sabal is immediate past editor of Journal of West Bengal Orthopedic Association, and he is a reviewer of Indian Journal of Orthopedics. With these words, I welcome uh, Professor Sabal uh, to today's program. Uh, we also have uh, with us uh, Professor Naresh Shetty, who's a consultant orthopedic surgeon, who's the president of MS Ramaya Medical College Hospital, Bangalore, Karnataka. He has organized numerous workshops on external fixation, arthroscopy, and total hip replacement. He has also done the AO advanced courses on operative treatment of fractures and non-unions, theoretical basis and practical principles at uh, New Delhi in 1994. Uh, Professor Shetty is a recipient of Traveling Fellowship awarded by Karnataka State Orthopedic Association it is a recipient of International Youth Exchange Program by Rotary International and Haw Medical Fellowship in 1993 to Hong Kong. He has also received the Best Paper Award in Karnataka Orthopedic uh, Conference twice in the year 2001 and 2004. Uh, with these words, I extend a very warm welcome uh, to Professor Shetty uh, and our gratitude for joining us and uh, sharing his thoughts, uh, which he will be doing. Uh, moving on from here, as I mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, I represent Pulse Pharmaceuticals, and uh, many of you know us uh, through our formulations like Dexil and uh, Neeflex. And today, uh, we are uh, in the process of launching a, a next power one gram formulation, uh, which is a, a paracetamol or acetaminophen, as we like to call it, a formulation. We have been, uh, and we are a very much patient centric innovation-driven integrated pharmaceutical company with an inclusive cohort model. We have our own R&D. We have our own manufacturing facilities. Uh, we have been in existence for past 25 years across the country and in the emerging markets. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a world-class R&D and a manufacturing infrastructure at uh, Hyderabad. And we have about uh, 150 scientists devoted to that. About 50% of that team is involved in the development of nano formulations. And we are leading in the space of nano pharmaceuticals and drug delivery research. Dexel is one of the first products we came across, that is, the 26,000 trash units of vitamin D in a nano uh, syrup form. We also have a, ladies and gentlemen, strong presence in medical nutrition through our 
Sister Concern, Pulse Nutri Science. Uh, recently, we have been involved in very high uh, level of protein extraction we have achieved and a new protein isolate formulation we have launched. And uh, we are following in the immunocell therapeutics by developing the CAR-T technologies, uh, which is uh, for the pulse slice uh, treatment of uh, cancer. For this, we are collaborating with uh, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, which is the CSIR Institute at Hyderabad. So this is about pulse pharmaceuticals and uh, I'm coming, uh, closing my uh, introduction part and uh, I'm handing the session over first to Professor Paul uh, for his uh, thoughts and deliberations on uh, the use of acetaminophen uh, in acute uh, pain. Uh, uh, it is over to you, uh, Professor Paul. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chaturvedi. Uh, so, uh, is my uh, slide is visible? Yes, sir. You have to go to the presentation mode. That's it. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shahaf is actually is working with me, and uh, I'm going to describe one special role of a special. Uh, it's not a special. It's a very general uh, analgesic. It's a very a general candidate, but it has a significant authentic and safety during the uh, uh, use in our day-to-day -day follow up. So there is a relief of acute pain. Now, this is the case. It is a 43 years old male who had fall, fall from motorcycle with large abrasion over the anterior aspect of the wrist. So identify the injury. See, what does the, there are several the significant injuries. See, there's a compression. As you can see here, there's a compression. How uh, it is it, it is compression collapse of the, the metaphyseal region as it is significantly displaced upwards. There is, there is shearing force. As you can see, this whole of the articular surface is shifted. Media shifted, it is on the lateral side. So this is shearing force also. At the same time, it has a significant rotational component also. See, this is the lateral view and see the whole hand is looking like a P view. So this is a significant rotational component. So this is a, it is a compression compression force as also the shearing force as also the rotational force so see the significant uh, the force is acting on this uh, this track in this injury now see there is a significant commission in the metaphyseal region so metaphyseal and articular surface both are communicated see this is the, the articular surface and this small amount of articular surface is remaining over here at the same time that means another uh, undisplaced or a, a fracture line <clears throat> so there is also dislocation as you can see, whole of the uh, the carpal bones along with the, the part of the distal part of the metaphyseal region is completely uh, separated and there is significant displacement. <clears throat> so this is the see the significance, this is the severity of the injury. Now the principles of reduction it is very, very important. So why I am uh, I am want to emphasize it? Don't take it, uh, it is very lightly as we took it lightly so that we try to uh, make it uh, uh, reduction even without uh, with uh, just without some sedation but uh, that there's some significant problem it developed as there are significant mass see as a whole of the uh, the, the distal part of the radius and alloy is separated so now there is significant soft tissue interposition so remember that so the only reduction should be attempted after complete relaxation complete muscle relaxation and sometimes it's at least one gentle pull if it fails to reduce then you have to open it so this is the message to uh, for the audience now what are the anticipatory complications most important is the soft tissue components as there's already there's some uh, large abrasion but at the same time there's some possibility of neurovascular injury and lead, maybe lead to some uh, acute compartment syndrome and uh, some uh, some median nerve injury uh, of, of this but fortunately in this case there is no such problem but there is a high chance of soft tissue injury the, these uh, muscles, ligaments, as also the neurovascular structures. So, uh, and another important one, as there is significant bone loss, even after the reduction, if it is possible, there is some possibility of add addition of some augmentations in the form of either bone graft or some bone substitutes. That has to be kept ready during the treatment. So everything should be ready during this, of, during this treatment. Now, uh, now another important challenge is, is the pain relief. 
So this, from this case, we started our journey, said that we started this paracetamol, that is we have uh, used this 15 milligram per kg preoperatively, that is at least once the patient has come, we started this and we kept it uh, intravenously. Why? Because of, uh, because we, we try to keep it uh, on, on uh, over the table over the OT table as early as possible uh, by this external fixer which doesn't require some uh, uh, waiting because if we it, if you go you go for the internal fixation we have to wait uh, till the uh, the appearance of the wrinkle sign but for the external fixation there is no time limit so we have to for the with the external fixation we, we we actually will be able to reduce it properly as also we address these soft tissues also. So that is why we started the paracetamol 15 milli per kg intravenously, preoperatively, and also power operatively. And after that, this oral one gram paracetamol should be continued for twice daily after food for two days. And we treated like this. It is a this is a, uh, see the, uh, at least two uh, attempts of close reduction failed to do that. At the same time, this see this part is completely separated, and that is that uh, that is the message I want to give to the audience because this uh, it, uh, this lightly should not be taken because there are several uh, complications can develop if one or two gentle reduction fails to the, provide the satisfactory reduction they have to open it and in this case particularly we have to open on the this side giving a single incision over this like this and we have found all of these extensor carpal radialis and the flexor carpal radialis muscles is completely superimposed in between this these are uh, this ulnar styloid and the whole of the ulna is coming out just it is impending to come coming out through the skin. Just uh, the, the whole of the ulna remains just under the skin. So it is a so significant injury was there. So we have to do this open reduction of this. So see that now after open reduction, it is coming uh, everything fold uh, in its place. And uh, then uh, the close reduction of the distal part and, um, the, and the three column fixation. Now you can see here, there is a say one column, the second column and those other side. We have fixed it with the help of this K where we didn't hold, didn't uh, keep hold over the ulnar styloid, but we use this K where just uh, on the radial side of the ulnar styloid so that the radial styloid remain in place and so that that will help in, in healing of the TFCC. At the same time, we, we kept, uh, we maintained that position with the help of the joint spanning external fixator. Now recovery from uh, uh, some regional anesthesia after three years, uh, three hours, but see the, with the help of this paracetamol we have already given before operation and during operation, there was significant pain relief which persisted for six hours post-operatively. Within six hours, uh, immediately after the stoppage of the operation, there was no energy was required. And then second and third dose repeated on the first day as it was uh, done in the morning. So it is uh, at this eight hour lead level, we use this IV paracetamol. On the second day, we use the oral paracetamol one gram uh, uh, twice daily actually. And there is significant satisfactory pain relief with functional recovery in subsequent period. This is another case. This is a five years old boy presented with exostrophy of the bladder. See, this is see, see the significant widening of the space, and there is a significant rotational deformity of the uh, of the of the both the lower limb. So, patient was unable to stand and walk properly because this is a completely externally rotated. See, this is the this is the, and that whole of the uh, the uh, this uh, genitalia demons uh, non-functional. And now uh, the patient came a little bit late. This sort of uh, this problem should be treated as early as possible, even within the first week of the, of the birth. But uh, this, uh, unfortunately, in our country, this sort of patient presented late. And uh, we have, we've got that patient five years after the uh, birth. And um, as basically, interesting point is, this sort of patient usually have some history of uh, in vitro fertilization, but particularly this case uh, didn't have the history of in vitro fertilization. But that, at the same time, there are several problems may uh, uh, would be there, but uh, like the, the urinary incontinence, the other abdominal uh, organ uh, may be abnormal. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this uh, guy is, doesn't have the, those sort of abdominal organ abnormality as also spine is also normal but uh, sometimes it is it is written in the in the book that say they, these sort of patients may have spinal abnormality but at the same time the patient has external rotation of the both the lower limbs there is difficulty in walking and standing and bladder develops outside the fetus that is the problem now so there are several musculoskeletal anomalies so just we uh, have the, in our um, books i'm not going into detail but what we did basically that on the on the, on the uh, pre operative workout we have found that that the, if we if we divide the whole of the uh, pelvis into two segments, is anterior segment and the posterior segment. The, the, the posterior segment there was twelve degree externally rotated, whereas in the anterior segment there are 
18 degree post uh, and uh, externally rotated. So there is overall, there are the 30 degree external rotation. But at the same time, there are several uh, operations was uh, described, but actually I we followed these, these uh, the procedures of Elsaid Sali, uh, who is described his procedure in 2019. It is a bilateral anterior transverse innominate and the vertical posterior iliac osteotomies. This, this is the, the, see, this is the uh, vertical posterior iliac osteotomy, and this is the anterior transverse osteotomy. It is done bilaterally. And after these operations, uh, during the oper just before the operation, we have to put the K-ware in situ. Just after once the uh, this osteotomy is completed, then the, this this osteotomy should be complete osteotomy, and this vertical osteotomy should be it is osteotomy osteoclasis. And once the osteotomy the os this uh, procedure is completed, whole of this uh, this uh, this assembly should be uh, connected with the transverse uh, transverse rod, and that has to be compressed as much as possible. It is not uh, possible to bring a uh, whole of the uh, bones together, but uh, whatever uh, uh, whatever uh, approximation is possible to have to do that so that this uh, the the uh, the pelvic organ should get some support from this uh, and this rotation, this derotationed uh, and this component. So this is the double osteotomy. The, the, we, uh, we followed that, but we are very much scared about the pain relief. So in that in case also, we use this paracetamol, IV intravenous paracetamol. It is 15 milligram per kg given paraoperatively and postoperatively eight hourly for two days. So uh, see, this is the, the radiograph, immediate postoperative radiograph. And see, this is the sacroiliac joint. And this is the line of the osteotomy. As you can see here, this is one line of osteotomy, this is a vertical osteotomy. And see, this is the transverse osteotomy, as you can see here. And this is, this, this is the middle component. And the k wires are put over there. And this is the anterior component. Both the, uh, this component on the both the sides, it is compressed together. And see now what is the actual um, the, uh, approximation we achieved uh, immediately after the operation. Now, uh, because of this, we, have, uh, we are very much uh, uh, satisfied with the pain relief. Patient uh, was a significant relief of pain immediately after the operation. And that says the pain relief was significant for the last two days. And now see this uh, at the six to eight weeks, we kept that external fixator, but uh, unfortunately the external fixator is relatively loose and uh, the patient didn't turn up. That is why there is, it removed it. Even at, in spite of that, see, this is the space we actually achieved and see the significant derotation of the pelvis. And see, the, we can we can now see this obturator problem and that indicates there is significant derotation can happen with this. And see, and this is the, the this is the reconstruction. This uh, second stage reconstruction is waiting. Now the patient is completely okay. And see this, uh, the alignment of the both the lower limb is absolutely normal. So because of this uh, paracetamol, there is satisfactory functional recovery with correction of the external rotational deformity of the lower limb. Now this is the case we performed uh, just recently, and Dr. Nupam Shah he assisted me. And see that we have uh, continued this project in our uh, new uh, 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 the, uh, place of posting in a Jalpaiguri Medical College. This is a seven years old girl. It has a history of fall on outstretched hand ten days back without neurovascular deficit. Now see this is the preoperative radiograph. Now there is we have we are very much in dilemma. So what is it? Is it a supracondylar fracture? Is it an intraarticular fracture like this? See, there's a possibility of intraarticular uh, separation and there are some lower epiphyseal fracture separation, which may be very much possible, but uh, uh, um, it is relatively, the age is not at, uh, suitable for that. Usually in the lower age, it's a much more lower age, it is seen. And another is the, is the it is dislocation, but see this in this case, it is a lower supracondylar fracture. It is a very low articular supracondylar fracture and there is a medial displacement. It is a very unique and unfortunately there is no neuro deficit, which is very common in this, these sort of patients like the radial nerve injury or the anterior interosseous nerve injury. But in this case, there is no neurovascular deficit and we, uh, we, uh, we plan for the uh, immediate close reduction and the target in a spinning. And this case also we treated with the intravenous paracetamol, this is 15 milligram per kg given paraoperatively, which is repeated after six hours per first day because the patient was uh, operated and at the middle of the day. So we finished the operation by about 3 p.m. And after uh, six uh, hours, we just repeated the second dose, but no other dose is required. But after that, we the second day we use that oral paracetamol. So this is the see this is the case. It is a we have satisfactory close reduction. There is a specific technique is just we have to put some vulgus force. We have, uh, we have to give some vulgus force initially to dislodge the fragment, and then we have to do the three man's technique. 
three months technique. So we have to prefer, uh, have a perfect reduction. And then this is a, the this is a three column fixation in this manner that the one one screw one k wad is given. There is a four cortex fixation through the olecranon fossa. Uh, the, the, so there is a closed direction three column k wad fixation done under uh, general anesthesia. And see, this is the paraparty picture where we have used these intravenous paracetamol. So there is a satisfactory immediate postoperative pain relief. Um, Lastly, this is the another case. This is a 29 years, nine years old male. This is also treated in our new place of posting in Jalpaiguri Medical College. This is a 29 year old male presented with a machinery injury of the little finger. See this little finger, there's no vascularity at all. So we decided to amputate it, but because well, as the patient is already some, uh, had taken some food, so we, uh, we, we decided to make a, a local anesthesia. So that is why we initially we started the intravenous paracetamol drip followed by the wrist block and during the operation, we can we repeated this intravenous paracetamol followed by the post-operative oral paracetamol. And there is a satisfactory pain relief. See, we have done, see, it, it is a partial ray amputation with a complete closure as the, the wound is relatively clean. So uh, second dose repeated after six hours and there is satisfactory pain relief occurred for four hours after the operation. So in my series, we uh, tried this technique that is in acute trauma, pediatric patients with or without congenital abnormality and also adult amputation. So I use intravenous paracetamol is a 15 milligram per kg before and preoperatively, uh, before and paraoperatively, uh, para which reduced the requirement of the analgesic post-op. And that is why we, it is known as the preemptive analgesia, which actually causes the central desensitization. What is that? Basically, in acute injury, in any injury of the tissue, that causes the peripheral sensitization as also the central desensitization, central sensitization. And because of this central sensitization, even after the physical recovery, there is a persistence of pain pain in the brain of the patients. And patient is not, never become satisfactory. That hampers the functional deficit, that functional recovery. And that uh, as the paracetamol, which is basically, it, is a, it blocks the COX-3 enzymes in the central nervous system that significantly desensitize in the central part of the central pathway of the pain that causes a significant relief of the pain after the operation. So that is a, that is why there is satisfactory pain relief which produces a satisfactory functional recovery which is the mainstay of any orthopedic treatment. So the safety and authenticity, this is a DCGI recommends 500 to 1000 milligram paracetamol with maximum up to three gram daily can be prescribed for the pain and the fever reduction. Paracetamol inhibits the synthesis of the prostaglandin in the central nervous system by inhibiting the enzyme, the cyclooxygenase 3 enzyme. There's a better tolerability and the minimal risk of serious side effects, which makes the paracetamol the drug of choice for pain relief and the fever management across the patient categories. Moreover, it is also beneficial for the patients in whom use of the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs are restricted, such as patients with the risk of gastrointestinal complications and of the aspirin sensitivity. Now looking for the future, paracetamol short half-life requires multiple doses. That means that has to be repeated four times daily. That is why there are some uh, requirement of uh, some sustained release uh, uh, production of the paracetamol. And now uh, there is some uh, pulse pharmaceutical. Uh, we are very much uh, um, fortunate that pulse pharmaceuticals, they are bringing that uh, sort of formulation and we are ready to use that. Uh, that formulation, that is a sustained release formulation, for which reduces the paracetamol. Uh, there is one third paracetamol immediately for the acute pain, as also it, it also provides the, the gradual release of this paracetamol for the long period for the chronic pain also. Therefore, for better compliance, sustained release paracetamol is needed for lesser repetition of the dose. Now, caution yes, there are some contraindications like the severe or decompensated hepatic disease states, particularly if patients are malnourished and are not eating or have a dry weight less than 50 kg. These are absolutely contradiction by paracetamol. Another important point is alcoholic liver disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is the basically it is better to avoid the paracetamol because there are several other drugs. And also there is another important condition is a non-alcoholic stereohepatitis, which is a precancerous condition. If it is spread suspected, it is better to avoid the paracetamol. On the other side, if there is a heavy drinker, average heavy drinker who is not malnourished and either has a no cirrhosis or early compensated cirrhosis, so we can use paracetamol, but a little bit reduced dose. That is three to two to three gram per day for short period of the time. 
So thank you. So this is our, my experience. Now I am give over to Dr. Naresh Shetty, and we are very eager to know the, the role of paracetamol in chronic uh, pain syndrome. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Prof. Uh, for sharing your thoughts on it and uh, giving us a fair degree of idea where to use and how to use in acute uh, situations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll moving on to Prof. Naresh Shetty for his deliberations on uh, use of paracetamol in chronic pain. And uh, once uh, uh, we have heard from uh, Dr. Naresh Shetty, then we'll uh, take the questions. So it is over to you, Prof. Naresh Shetty. Oh. Yeah, you are audible, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm just yeah. looking at where my slide's gone. Just hold on. Yeah, sure, sir. sir. I think in the between of opening and closing, I think... Uh, I to go back down. In the meantime, is there any questions we can take and we can discuss? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, uh, you can type it in the chat box uh, and we can take it from there. Uh, yes, it is okay. Okay, so it's started, sir. So, okay. We'll uh, stick to the earlier this thing that we take it at the end. We have your slides, sir, on the screen. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity and thank you, Paul, for really uh, showing some beautiful slides of the trauma cases and what have we done in uh, probably uh, how effectively you used uh, paracetamol in acute cases. Uh, what I'm going to do is to just give you a little brief uh, evidence-based uh, 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 idea of what's happened so far in for paracetamol or acetophemin in, in chronic pain. So anything that lasts for more than one, more than three months, we call it a chronic pain. It could be continuous intermittent. And this will definitely interfere with your daily activities. A lot of times people with chronic pain, they go into depression, anxiety, and have difficulty in sleeping. It is approximated that 20% of the adults of different sexes and races and economic backgrounds all fall victim to chronic pain. The cost of chronic pain are substantial. We do not have enough data actually about Indian condition because not much studies have been done towards it. But a report way back in 2010 by the Institute of Medicine it says that almost chronic pain afflicts approximately one in three Americans, and it costs anywhere between US 560 million US dollars, billion dollars per year in medical cost and lost productivity. So 35% of the Americans suffer from pain. More than 50 million Americans are partially or totally disabled by chronic pain. 50 million workers, they are lost every year. And 100 billion is the estimated annual cost. Do people really get relief? 
And what has been generally thought is 40 to 50% of this patient in routine practice setting fails to achieve adequate pindalite. They're trying to find different varieties and methods. And all of you know that a lot of patients have our backache. They go from various places to get relief and still don't feel get relief as what they wanted. In a recent study of 805 chronic pain sufferers, more than 50 had to change physicians to achieve relief because, and they feel that the physicians are not doing the job well. Commonly you get uh, chronic pain because of arthritis, back pain, neck pain, cancer pain, headaches, fibromyalgia, neurologic pain, migraines, and so on and so forth. Basically the pain is a very complex matter to measure. And we, we are nearly not sure when a person complains of pain, how far it really uh, 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 to measure it. And so uh, it is a major issue. And there are many complications of such pain and it can interfere terribly with everyone's quality of life. The normal uh, painkillers that are available are the NSAIDs, acetaminophen, anticonvulsants, and antidepressants, steroids, and I mean, we have taken a whole variety of these things that are happening. And many times we are used to uh, and, uh, one of them or we are used in combination. You have used both painkillers, NSAIDs, we have topical products, we use opiates when some of these patients. And so we have used wide variety of painkillers for different kinds of patients. And yet there are still a significant amount of patients who feel that they do not have the right kind of drugs available. But one thing is very clear from many, many years ago and from many decades, paracetamol is the most commonly used analgesic worldwide and recommended as the first line treatment in all paid condition by WHO. Now, why is it, uh, Dr. Paul did talk about this, uh, some of its side effects, Hepatic uh, toxic and otherwise. But I think among all the things, because of its safety uh, today, I think it is remains as the primary drug, as the first line of treatment for most of the pain issues of the world over. And if at all, in some of these cases where it's contraindicated, the NSA is contraindicated, like gastric ulcer, asthma, pregnant women, nursing women, children, parastamols are widely used. I was looking at some of the systemic review of the efficacy of acetaminophen, and many studies have come in. And what is found is the chronic pain, uh, 65 to 85% lifetime prevents. Second most common complaint uh, to prompt medical evaluation. And there's a lot, I did talk about the long term disability. The current problem with chronic pain is patient gets preoccupied with pain, is disabled, he gets depressed and anxious, and then a lot of people get into psychiatric issues. And of course, uh, in our country where drugs are available off the stores, anywhere, I think a lot of people misuse drugs. And uh, though uh, with paracetamol, addiction is a rare event at all. So in, uh, in a patient, say, what is the most common which an orthopedic surgeon looks at? One of the most common is the chronic uh, low back pain. And when you're looking at low back pain, we take the history, location, kind of pain, severity, aggravating factor, posture, what is motions, neurological and vascular injuries. We do a lot of x-rays, MRIs, and otherwise. And then we have treatment consideration uh, of uh, multiple uh, one-shot many things that are available right from physiotherapy uh, to multiple disciplinary pain clinic. The other problem was the osteoarthritis, which we will talk about it. And I think every lady after 50 years get into osteoarthritis. And almost 80% of the people over 55 years say have knee pain. The pain is a deep aching, causes them sometimes loss of sleep, morning stiffness, and so uh, it depends upon the kind of pain that the people would talk about. And I think every third patient that comes to your clinic is either a patient of back pain or knee pain. 
making a diagnosis is simple as far as we are concerned uh, but uh, what we are making is how do we actually treat these chronic uh, issues with varieties of medication that are available and every day some company or the other bringing new drugs or a combination of drugs and we all know that in us the fda fda does not approve of a combination of drugs which is very rampant in our country and i think we have some of the drugs which are not one combination two three four and much more and it's like uh, everything is put in one in given to you uh, and powered activities which probably is we are not very sure about how whether it is a synergistic activity that or it is contraindicated none of us require it but our drug rules are very very uh, flimsy and so people get away with it but uh, generally paracetamol is a frequently prescribed drug for osteoarthritis among the participants in usa osteoarthritis initiative or 80% reported using medication for knee pain in the last 12 months fibromyalgia is another really common problem that we keep on getting it uh, wake pains especially in females and the problems are they are not very sure where actually is the pain and uh, and numbness is another point that they are talking about so what we need to require is that in most of this condition that they are looking is we still believe that the world over like the tylenol which is a main prescribed drug in us paracetamol is remain the primary line of treatment and many comparison has been done regarding the efficacy of ibuprofen and acetaminophen in chronic and acute condition and significant number of patients reported a high degree of pain relief when treated with ibuprofen so there are a lot of papers that says that ibuprofen are superior than paracetamol but there is also study which gives equal importance of both medication and has said that both drugs are needed as neither drug will be more effective for many patients there is one more study in hong kong about 300 adult patient with musculoskeletal limb pain were given acetaminophen and acid and a combination there was an insignificant difference in the average reduced intensity of pain score between any treatment all the combination proved safe so what is the well, this is the latest lancet 2021 uh, series which says an update on burden best practices and new advances and what we can need do is only one thing pain is the main reason why people seek medical care and the three of the top reason of pain is osteoarthritis back pain and headache so orthopedic surgeons takes almost 60% of the reason why people come with pain among the four leading causes of ear loss to disability three of this back pain musculoskeletal disorder neck pain are chronic pain condition prevalence of chronic pain varies between 11% and 40% in a study with US Center for Disease Control and a last year four year longitudinal study also done in UK found that the annual incidence rate for chronic to be 8.3% so what does it all mean and what is the way people have been treating the there has been a rampant use of paracetamol everywhere by most of the people simply because i think people have got a thought that is the most safest of the drug and in unbelievable story in 2013 primary care physician in england wrote 22 million prescription of paracetamol at a cost of 82 million pounds compared to 4.2 million prescription of ibuprofen at a cost of 14 that means even today paracetamol is the first line of treatment or the first love of almost all the surgeons Paracetamol account for two thirds of the overall over the counter painkiller market, which is around 200 million packs per month sold every year in the United Kingdom. And the good thing is, the paracetamol is recommended as the first line of treatment for low back pain and osteoarthritis. Nice guidelines. There was one meta-analysis that was done whether paracetamol reduces the pain of osteoarthritis. and 10 rcts were taken in and the main outcome measure was pain stiffness and functional score 
results were paracetamol were effective in relieving due to osteoarthritis however nacids were better than paracetamol for pain relief clinical response rate was higher with nacids than with paracetamol however nacids were associated with more frequent gastrointestinal discomfort than paracetamol so when it looked at relieving pain and swelling nacid looked better however the incidence of gastric intolerance was higher in the nacid group so what are the real evidence that are say several international guidelines that are there the first line analgesics are for a choice of management for chronic pain as it provides cost effective analgesia without the risk associated with the nacid still remains paracetamol based on currently available data the use of alternate analgesia such as tramadol and opiates either alone or combination with paracetamol is warranted in those patient whose pain does not respond to non narcotic analgesia so it means that tramadol and paracetamol is got as a combination has got good place in treating people <clears throat> so i will just give two case studies i mean basically and not something means i was planning to do it but we'll just keep it short because chronic condition the patient wants relief and nothing else more than that and i was talking this is a patient of a 70 year old housewife complaints of pain and swelling of both knee for 3 months tried local massage and native treatment without relief had coin treatment which i got in pain there are a lot of patients that go there is a guy who actually um, um, puts a coin and then over that a belladonna plaster and uh, whether it's a back pain knee pain or wherever it is even for headache i think he puts it and it, uh, people go in in droves to get uh, relief from it uh, but i guess uh, this uh, this is how uh the psychology of patients work now this lady had morning stiffness inability to squat or climb or walk for more than 500 meters she was overweight physically inactive has diabetes and hypothyroid then means she has got multiple problems not only of the knee pain but she is also overweight physically inactive and has got comorbid diabetes and hypothyroid she had the and you look at her x ray she's got a varus deformity range of uh, movement had reduced and x ray shows varus deformity with reduced middle joint it is kl3 see so goes the middle joint is totally gone however our problems are the patient was advocated the role of surgery she was just unwilling to talk about surgery and she said you do anything except surgery she also took a magnet therapy uh, which she thought she felt better for a few days and then she said she was back but by the time she was poorer by another 60000 rupees i just put her on a paracetamol 500 mg qid initially i spoke to her at length and i think half the problem was not pain but most of the thing she had lot of other issues that were there so i spoke to her about it length and told her that this will take lot of time i put her on the most one of the most simplest of the painkillers paracetamol in view of her other patients like diabetes and hypertension i gave her some local application to use and told her to do some physiotherapy and interestingly the pain reduced by 25% in the first month and uh, the swelling also reduced and uh, for after a long time she looked a little cheerful she felt that the pain is going to go off and i i did tell her that it's going to take a long time and then the pain may recur in the fact because i know that there was hardly any joint space on the medial side paracetamol i did continue for another one month pain reduced by 50% morning stiffness reduced uh, activity of daily living improved now she has stopped and now is on occasional medication so but she does her exercise regularly she has lost her weight a little and i think that's one of the reason why the pain is reduced and she takes uh, uh, occasional paracetamol whenever she uh, has got pain but i think related to she is better 
Now, whether this is, she was became better because of multiple reasons or is it for because of paracetamol? It's very difficult to say. This is another guy uh, with a chronic back pain, a 60 year old army veteran. He had complained of back pain for six months, had a fall about 20 years back. Complaints of claudication pain, he would not be able to walk more than a half a kilometer, had morning stiffness, lying down, he had rest pain, sleep disturbances, and was a known diabetic hypertension and chronic renal failure. So x-rays of his lumbar spine was taken and it shows degenerative changes uh, of the spine. Mm, there was no actually uh, fractures, uh, uh, compression fracture, but it was a degenerative spine. And we got an MRI done, which shows multiple disc prolapse with a tight canal. Uh, I mean, view of his multiple comorbid condition, we thought we will do a conservative line of treatment. We started in a, on a physio. We'd give him an epidural injection. He had a relief for a short time and then the pain increases. NICID was not suggested in view of his comorbid status. He's now on 1,000 milligrams uh, at night. Pain is reduced. Morning stiffness is less. Activity of daily living is significantly improved. Physiotherapy has been continued. So what I would want you to understand is that uh, a multimodal uh, management of some of these chronic patients are going to give us good uh, uh, results. And more important, I think the confidence that we can give to the patient by talking to them for over a period of time, explaining to them the complication of some of the painkillers that can happen, and then do it with a combination of a physiotherapy, weight reduction. I think that's the one that's going to help the patient. In conclusion, I think paracetamol is an effective agent for pain relief due to osteoarthritis. Although safe, it is less effective than NACID. For safety reason, paracetamol should be the first line treatment with NACD reserved for those who do not respond. And the take home message would be, paracetamol is effective in relieving pain, and relieving mild to moderate pain. Meta-analysis in RT shows that higher single-dose paracetamol generally achieves more effective pain relief than low single-dose paracetamol, 500 mg 650. The greater pain relief was most clearly shown in studies directly comparing the two doses of paracetamol. The rate of adverse events was similar in studies comparing higher doses with lower doses of paracetamol. The guidelines recommend paracetamol as an effective initial oral analysis of mild and moderate pain in patients with knee pain or osteoarthritis. For osteoarthritis or in the ULR guidelines recommend paracetamol as the oral analysis of first choice. German, Austrian and Swiss Headache Society and German Society of Neurology recommend paracetamol as the first line option for self-medication of mild and headache. So all in all, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, an era when we have multiple things that are available, we have to make a choice. And the choice is safety for the patient, safe to ensure that whatever we do, mm, uh, ensure that the safety is never, never uh, uh, compromised. I think paracetamol will remain mm, one of the important uh, 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 part of our uh, treatment. And uh, without a doubt, I guess uh, we will we will see that more and more people would be uh, getting into paracetamol as the world shows that. And I think uh, there is a role for uh, paracetamol, which are sustained release, where we do not have to give them multiple times. And if that happens, the compliance of the patient would be better. And I think the quality of life of the patient will improve. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Shetty, for uh, putting it across so succinctly. And uh, we all believe that uh, modern medicine firmly believes that uh, in the motto of safety first. So uh, if you can't, uh, you know, uh, help the situation, don't mess with it. And uh, therefore, uh, that was a, a very correct emphasis on the use of uh, paracetamol. And uh, as you and Professor Paul had indicated, uh, uh, it can help us uh, 
through the painful uh, conditions, whether they are acute or the chronic, and really have uh, the the your strategy and your observations with low back pain or quite uh, or back pain, as you said, uh, quite uh, uh, interesting. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you heard Prof. Spal and Prof. Shetty uh, sharing their uh, thoughts on the use of paracetamol. So I'm sure you can type the questions in the chat box uh, that is there. And we have the access to it. And we can uh, ask those questions to uh, both Prof. Shetty and Prof. Spal. One of the things I've been uh, thinking about in which I was uh, uh, looking at, uh, I mentioned it uh, right in the beginning. We have a range uh, generally of 5 milligram per kg to 15 milligram per kg body weight when we talk about paracetamol. Uh, the range remains same uh, whether we are looking at uh, fever or whether we are looking at uh, pain. But uh, we have at times when uh, the fever is not responding, uh, we have the option of going up to a single dose of 30 milligram per kg. Uh, though it's a much higher dose, almost uh, double the kind of dose. And uh, it works sometimes. Uh, more or I would say that more times than, uh, it does that. Do we, uh, do we ever think of uh, a pain which is not uh, responsive uh, uh, generally to the usual doses? Uh, we think of in terms of going at a higher doses, uh, doses beyond uh, 15 milligram per kg. First to Prof. Spal and then uh, to Prof. Sushi. Yes, definitely. We can increase the dose up to maximum your right, that is 30 mg per kg. But uh, especially for the, the Indian uh, population, those who have uh, average weight, body weight is 60 uh, kg. So in that case, I think it is 15 mg is uh, sufficient enough. Then sometimes we increase up to 20 mg per kg mm. and maximum 25 mg. In my, uh, my series, in suppose there is a patient as a say 100 kg weight. So in that case, we increased up to 25 kg. Uh, in my series, I use that. And mm -hmm. that is there is no problem at all. That it is already that is used for the immediate relief of pain for fast 24 to 48 hours. Once the pain intensity is reduced, then we can we again uh, revert back to usual dose. That okay. is my yeah. Uh, Dr. Shetty, your take on that, sir. Yeah, I, I I also uh, agree that uh, there's I mean uh, most of our patients uh, Indian standards uh, the weights are between sixty to eighty kgs are the standard weight set of the patients, mm -hmm. and I think there is a, a role for increasing it to uh, a little more up to twenty or twenty five, but uh, to going towards the uh, full extent may not be required in most of the cases. What I would think in these areas where uh, pains have not really uh, significantly mm, changed, uh, the pain is not reduced, I think we should look at an alternatives or a combination rather than a single drug. So that, that's what I would do. Uh, taking another cue from what you have just now said, and uh, some while back uh, I was reading that there was a greater emphasis on combined treatment and alternative treatment. So uh, you, you combine and then you move one drug out. Uh, but that is something which is more used in febrile patients and especially in uh, the pediatric population. Correct. Uh, that is what I have read. So uh, that is something that uh, we indulge in uh, more frequently or uh, uh, there is a certain category of patients we reserve for that and that's where we use it. Professor Shetty first. So I think in most of the time, in especially in chronic back pain, I do use uh, patients who have not found any relief. I do use tramadol along with them. And uh, whenever it does that, I think there's a difference where the pain feels, the patient feels much better than what he is. So I have this combination, but I also ensure that I give them some physical therapy also as a part of an exercise or the physiotherapy that goes around. So it's not just one medication that is added. It's a combination of the physical therapy also is added along with that. <clears throat> no, sir, but uh, is it that uh, what I was trying to uh, understand uh, is uh, if we, we for some time, for certain duration, for example, you can't use NSAIDs for a very long period of time. You know, your probably prescriptions would be five to seven days, maybe uh, at the most, maybe someone may get it for 10 days, probably. I'm not sure about it. So uh, we combine them and then we move off to a single drug. 
and as per the need we go back uh, to the dual uh, therapy or uh, how do we do that yeah i i think i think ultimately is that once the patient feels better then you have a choice to actually uh, ensure that change is drug reduce the uh, dosage you know, i mean you have all the choices and mm -hmm. i think one of the best choices that i keep on coming and saying is if at all we have a sustained release form formulation or or a, do a formulation that will have the patient to take the drug as limit minimal number of possible then the compliance issue is taken care of and most of the time they will feel better faster this is what i always say okay so uh, prof uh, prof paul was joining in yes yes, sir. yes. this is a very nice question you have asked there is a, in which condition the paracetamol is required to be added with some uh, other medication and whether it is a single drug therapy or the uh, multiple multiple drug therapy may be required in which condition yes for the chronic for the acute condition i think this a paracetamol single drug therapy is it is excellent excellent pain relief and as you have uh, rightly mentioned in some special situation we can increase the drug dosage for the for a limited period once the pain intensity is reduced we can go, go back to the uh, usual process dosage for the chronic one suppose there is a low back pain especially the osteoarthrosis so in low back pain there is some i think in my practice i we divided the low back pain group in three categories one is the mechanical pain another is the inflammatory pain another another is the infective neoplastic group so okay. in a very busy schedule in a, preferably in an in a epg mir we had to examine at least 1000 per uh, patient overall in in our team uh, per day so it is very difficult to differentiate in a very busy schedule. So I, I made my life easier. Just yeah, we, we taught our uh, colleagues that to just ask the two questions, whether it is a, what is the aggravating factor and what is the relieving factor. If the aggravating factor is the, it, it is the activity and the relieving factor is the rest, that is definitely it is a mechanical disease like the lumbosacral spondylosis, lumb spondylosis, everything mechanical. So the, even in the disc prolapse. So that is the aggravating factor is the activity, relieving factor is the rest. So if, that is the one. If the, there is just opposite, that is the aggravating factor is the rest, relieving factor is the activity, it is due to an inflammatory pain. And, and if the in, in infective myoplastic, as the cause is present throughout the period, so there, so aggravating factor is the activity, but there is no relieving factor. So it is easy to differentiate. Now, if it is a mechanical pain, so in uh, it is a severe, depending on the severity and the sensitivity of the individual, so you always uh, use combination of the drugs, especially for the younger patients. So in, the, in those cases, we usually use acetam, it is a acyclofenac, along with acetaminophen, that is paracetamol. So initially we use that drug for uh, four or five days. Once the pain subsides, then we can we continue the paracetamol as a single drug. Now, if it is an inflammatory disease, suppose it is an ankylosing spondylitis or rheumatoid arthritis. Similarly, if it is an osteoarthritis of the knee, where there is the inflammatory component is significant enough, so patient, patient is complaining of burning sensation. So that is that is a, a specific clinical parameters, clinical symptoms of inflammation. In those cases, I usually combine uh, acetaminophen or paracetamol along with some anti-inflammatory uh, drug like either etoricoxib or the naproxen. If the patient is cardiotoxic, I don't use the uh, etoricoxib because etoricoxib is known to increase the blood pressure. So in those cases, I usually use the naproxen for 10 to 14 days. So that is my practice actually. Uh, so uh, the, in this way, I can combine it. Yes, okay. that's a very, very, uh, very interesting thing because yes. I was also uh, thinking that uh, we can have nociceptive and uh, neuropathic and nociplastic uh, as, as as you mentioned. Okay. And, uh, and especially when we look at uh, uh, the cancer pain and we look at the step lever approach, which has been proposed and propagated by the WHO, we see step. every step is paracetamol. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I always uh, think, even talk to my colleagues, they say that uh, you mm -hmm. to add paracetamol and to NSAID. I said, no, it's the, the NSAID which is added to the paracetamol. At the same time, that. actually, <laughs> we are feeling the need for uh, sustained release paracetamol yes. uh, because we are we want to reduce the frequency of the dosage that will also improve the compliance of the, our patient also. The uh, with the sustained release uh, uh, one gram kind of a thing, I think most of the times you would be looking at a BID kind of a administration. Yes. And uh, and I think that would be adequate in most of the situations because we would be able to maintain the the concentration around the clock. 
may not be the always the peak because it will have the cycle but yes uh, sufficiently above 7 to 8 uh, microgram uh, per ml kind of concentration which will facilitate uh, the 12 hour administration yes but in spite of this uh, obviously the it will help us uh, spare uh, the usage of certain other drugs uh, maybe uh, what else uh, are you looking from a sustained release? Yes, there is a concentration which is achieved and pain relief. Uh, are, are there any uh, thoughts ever uh, in terms of safety uh, with the, because we are giving a higher dose kind of a thing? Though the, the upper limit is about 3 grams a day. Yes, sustained release paracetamol, if the dose is higher, you can use that uh, sustained release paracetamol 3 gram. So there is, I think if there's that formulation that releases the paracetamol for one gram within one or two hours, and the rest of the two gram is released throughout the eight to 10 hours, that would be excellent. Mm -hmm. I think it will provide the significant concentration of paracetamol in, inside the blood, which is the exact uh, uh, concentration is required for pain relief, as also from other anti-inflammatory and uh, antipyretic also. Your thoughts, sir, Dr. Shetty, sir? So, uh, it has been generally talked about is that paracetamol is not a good anti-inflammatory drug, number one. So, I think there is always a choice and a chance that we might have to combine that, uh, like uh, Paul is talking about naproxen being utilized along with that. And then certainly, yes, but I think what is like rightly said, it would be for a limited period of time. And subsequently, I think we'll go on to a drug which is safe, which can be used for a longer period of time. Uh, when I was talking about back pain, we were just talking about long-term drug where we are trying to avoid talking about, because by the time we would have made a diagnosis whether it is uh, to do anything with uh, malignancy, that is totally ruled out as a part of it. So it could be only an inflammatory or it probably could be degenerative. And both these places, I think paracetamol has got a say. Ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, talking to Professor Paul and Professor Shetty uh, on the use of paracetamol and uh, chronic pain and acute pain. If you have any questions to us, please uh, do type them in the chat box so uh, we can uh, we can take those questions up. Uh, somewhere, uh, I think uh, the Professor Shetty mentioned that. Uh, about 40 to 50 percent of the patients uh, get relief with a particular uh, uh, treatment and uh, especially if, uh, a single treatment i i believe uh, that is what he meant and there is a need to combine uh, two drugs in uh, the remaining population or uh, or even if we use the combinations it is about 40 to 50 percent is the kind of relief that we are getting uh, in in the population Yeah. Yes, sir. yes, that is right. So for with paracetamol, it is that is right. His experience is absolutely right. There is 40 to 50 percent patient is gets benefited along with that. But after that, if there is no benefit, uh, we have to either we have to think of what is the exact cause of pain, underlying cause of pain, and we have to treat that. Otherwise, we can have uh, combine with it, which is the safer one. What else, uh, uh... Uh, reading, uh, sir, what is the ideal uh, for an ideal uh, uh, analgesic to be considered? What would be the pain kind of pain relief? Because I understand that uh, for pain relief, uh, 1%, it starts with a 36% relief because about 35% of the population is placebo responders. So when you have 36%, so population, so or kind of relief, so you're looking at 1% uh, of the thing. So what generally uh, would be, we, we are happy with 40 to 50% of the ideally drug looking at about uh, six, 70%, 65, 70% of pain relief uh, with a particular drug. Uh, what would be the ideal uh, target or for an ideal drug to kind of provide the relief? So it's difficult to say. Yes. Uh, it, this is this is something uh, pain is not just uh, the feeling you know each one is very very subjective it's 
not an and the objective assessment also can never give you the true indicators of pain so i think very very difficult but i think as long as the patient feels that symptomatically his pains are getting less i think those are the ones that will stick with you and will say okay let me try the same drugs and go on okay because it will become more compliant that's how it is but very very difficult to say uh, objectively is all very very subjective whenever you know uh, pain is a hugely subjective and yeah, yeah and especially when you are looking at chronic pain then there is a huge amount of maladaptation uh, from the patient correct correct and uh, which becomes uh, very uh, difficult so uh, Uh, i i think uh, the audience are not uh, this thing so uh, first i'll have uh, one uh, i'm coming towards the concluding the program so final words first from professor pal on 1 uh, gram of paracetamol <coughs> sustained release uh, yes quick uh, take yeah. and place in therapy and uh, what we can expect for it exactly in a quick yes so uh, from this uh, evening we have what we have learned about the paracetamol is a basically it is a uh, most uh, safe drug uh, and also this is effective drug when we use in a, we have to choose it in a particular condition where we have to use it so in a judicious if you judicious is select the condition paracetamol lacked as a wonder drug that is and then several uh, uh, several uh, experiments are going on even in the subcutaneous infusion of paracetamol it is being under under study and i think within 3 uh, 4 years or 5 years it will come in the market so paracetamol uh, it is it is it is several experiments are going on with the paracetamol because this is one of the most safe drug uh, apart, apart from the hepatic injury acute hepatic injury or sig significant hepatic injury it is almost safest drug in almost all condition so that is that that is to be used and that is with the first line of uh, treatment even in the acute condition as also in any chronic condition but uh, if there is some uh, sig not significant relief then we have to think of uh, what is the underlying cause we have to treat that underlying cause otherwise we can have to choose the other drugs which is the rate be safer for combination this is my uh, message thank you sir professor shetty uh, you are taking on uh, paracetamol one gram yeah so uh, what i think is uh... in the last so many decades so many drugs have come in and so many have gone so many has come with adverse problems and cardiac events renal problems and otherwise but paracetamol has maintained itself as a safe drug all throughout so uh, it has become like a fashion some suddenly some new drug comes and then they because of the fact that it's been sold very well or marketed very well then it, it reaches a peak and then one fine morning then we start getting reports of saying all the contraindication that is possible that has happened to some of the drugs uh, which talks to inhibitors which we are talking about which we all know which has come gone and we have used also but unfortunately we came about the side effects later on but any drug which has remained for so long must have something in it and i think it's good to see that these drugs are made more uh, useful to the rest of the society and one of the thing the sustained release is really going to make a difference in the way the patient can be treated and uh, progressively uh, the research as i mentioned uh, during the initial part of my interesting introduction we are more talking about uh, the spinal sites and we are all talking about amyloid and other receptors where it does would be able to bring in some anti inflammatory aspect though maybe not as uh, as good as other as good as the nsets but yes uh, somewhere you know uh, it will find usage in that also so what i am uh, gather from it uh, it's a very safe drug it's a first line treatment irrespective of uh, uh, acute or the chronic pain and the 15 mg per kg is the minimal kind of a dose uh, which should be given so that makes 1 gram formulation which and we can use it for uh, twice a day and thrice a day and this thing it helps us share, spare the use of nsaids opiates also uh, because those are more troublesome issues than what we have now uh, so paracetamol is fairly safe irrespective of the type of the pain it can be used and it should be the first first drug which should be used and uh, there can be a switch therapy also after the intra uh, the, the intravenous uh, usage we can move uh, to the, uh, the oral therapy so these are some of the facets uh, that we have come out uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, the safety remains the hallmark 
and uh, yes, uh, we have the provision to go still go to the higher doses of paracetamol, but then that is uh, special situations, and that should not be what the practice should become frequently because all said and done, uh, every drug has its own uh, limitations and uh, we need to be keeping that in mind. But uh, yes, we need to use it, use it judicially and in the sufficiently higher doses to get the optimal benefit. That is what I understand. We should not be running scared. Even though it is a one gram sustained release, we are fairly sure about the safety of this. And uh, by and by, uh, we are looking for it, finding it place in your practice. But these uh, words, uh, there are no questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll be returning you to the studio. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you. Uh, I especially thank Prof. Bal and Prof. Shetty for taking out time. And though it's a Saturday evening and uh, it's getting a bit late, it's a family time, uh, which is also there. Uh, but uh, yes, sir, so it's uh, you've given us a lot of clarity where and how it can be used. With these words, I thank you so much uh, for your thank time. You. And we'll be troubling you again. Thanks a lot. Bye, bye, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Pompa, everyone. Bye. Bye. Can you hear me?